Good afternoon. I'm Ian Penman and I'm a senior associate here as here at Brodie's, specialising in restructuring and insolvency. Can I have slide two, please? Together with my colleagues, Laura Fell and Lynn Livesey, we'll be looking at the risks for directors in this time of insolvency insurance and insurance during COVID-19. If I could have slide two, please. Today, we're going to cover directors' duties, the suspension of wrongful trading due to COVID-19, issues we see on insolvency, directors and officers insurance, potential claims and issues arising, including in relation to health and safety obligations and preserving your indemnity cover. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do those via the Q&A function in Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, we're on slide three, I see. Starting with director's duties, it's not just about managing and controlling a business. It also involves taking on certain legal duties and obligations. Directors get the benefit of limited liability, but their duties impose certain obligations on them to act, ensure, to ensure they act in the best interests of the company, its employees, shareholders, and in certain circumstances, its creditors too. Directors' duties were codified in the UK about 15 years ago under the Companies Act 2006. So in that sense, there's nothing new about being obliged to behave in a certain way. However, what is particularly relevant at the moment is insolvency law, which obliges a director to consider the interests of creditors if their business is insolvent or at risk of insolvency. With many businesses facing financial pressure created by the impact of COVID-19, there may be a temptation for directors to focus purely on the survival of the business. However, if that focus results in a breach of duties, there are potential penalties to be faced, and these can be severe, such as directors' disqualification or being held personally liable for company debts. I'll be giving a quick overview of the general duties, plus breaches to be aware of, particularly with the economic impact COVID-19 is having on the economy. The general duties of a director are to act within their powers, to promote the success of the company, to exercise independent judgment, to exercise a reasonable skill, care and diligence, to avoid conflicts of interest, to declare interest in a proposed transaction or arrangement with the company and to not accept benefits from third parties. If an insolvency process is initiated, then the appointed insolvency practitioner is obliged to investigate the reason for the company's insolvency and to consider the conduct of its directors. This can result in questions being raised about actions taken and the insolvency practitioner and in some cases also creditors, can challenge directors' conduct with a view to recovering money and or assets for the benefit of the creditors. The aim always is to restore the company to the position it would have been in had the conduct that is challenged not taken place. There are three offences to be aware of under the Insolvency Act 1986. Wrongful trading, applies to current and former directors of companies that have gone into liquidation or administration who allowed the business to continue trading even when they knew or ought to have been aware that liquidation or administration was inevitable. You may have seen reports about the temporary relaxation of this law to help businesses impacted by COVID-19, but I'll come back to that later. Misfeasance, applies where a director has misapplied, retained, or otherwise become accountable for any money or property of the company. Where that occurs, a court may order the director to contribute appropriately to the company's assets. Fraudulent trading applies where a director is found to have carried on any company business with the intention of defrauding creditors. Where that occurs, again, the court can order the director to make an appropriate condition, contribution to the company's assets to whatever extent it continue, considers appropriate to return creditors to the position they should have been in. 
there may be financial, there may be circumstances, sorry, where it is appropriate for a business to continue and to try and trade its way out of financial difficulties in an attempt to avoid formal insolvency. If doing so, directors must tread carefully and be mindful of the business's creditors. If insolvency is a risk, directors should be reviewing the financial position of the company continuously to ensure they are not acting in a way that is detrimental to creditors and that by continuing to trade, creditors' position is not being worsened. They must keep records too. These need to be detailed showing what decisions were made and why, in case this has to be shown and justified later. And probably most important of all, take advice from a restructuring specialist such as a solicitor or an insolvency practitioner at an early stage. Considering creditors if there is a concern that a company is verging on insolvency cannot be overemphasized. The consequences for breaching these duties can have serious repercussions on debtors, in particular their future ability to act in that role and their personal assets. If we could turn to slide four please. I mentioned earlier the wrongful trading rules which can result in directors being personally liable for losses incurred as a result of continued trading. Now, these were temporarily suspended in recognition of the large number of businesses being impacted by COVID-19. While this news was welcomed by business across the UK, directors should not take this as an invitation to be complacent about responsibilities. What is wrongful trading and who does it apply to? Well, it's an offence under sections 214 and 246 ZB of the Insolvency Act 1986. It applies to directors and former directors of companies that have entered into liquidation or administration, together known as insolvency proceedings, and who allowed the company to continue to trade when they knew or ought to have been aware that the company could not avoid insolvency proceedings. The test for wrongful trading is that once a director has concluded or ought to have concluded that there is no reasonable prospect of the company avoiding insolvency proceedings, then at that point, the director has a duty to take every step that a reasonably diligent person would take to avoid or reduce potential loss to the company's creditors. If the director fails to do so, then following insolvency proceedings, any insolvency practitioner appointed can seek an order from the court requiring the debtor to make a contribution be it in money or money's worth to the company's assets as the court considers appropriate. The court's powers of redress for wrongful trading are designed to be compensatory, not punitive, and their purpose is to put the company back in the position it would have been but for the actions of the directors. Now, I mentioned wrongful trading being suspended. That occurred initially for the period 1st March 2020 to 30 September 2020. The suspension was then reactivated on 26 November 2020 and ran until the 30th of June 2021. The decision by the UK government to suspend wrongful trading was heralded as pro-business and part of the strategy to protect employment. However, the decision doesn't really de-risk matters for directors. This is because there's been no general suspension of the director's duties I mentioned earlier, nor of misfeasance or fraudulent trading, the other two offences under the Insolvency Act. This means there's surely a risk associated with any decision taken by directors of companies to continue to trade while knowing it can't avoid insolvency proceedings. The relaxation of wrongful trading should not therefore be regarded as a panacea for directors. If we could turn to the next slide, please. The suspension of wrongful trading may have meant that some directors have relaxed their diligence in the expectation that they don't have to worry about things during COVID. It's vital to remember that wrongful trading was only suspended for the limited period I mentioned and that the other obligations on directors continued. 
In my field of work, we often pursue directors for wrongful trading, and where we do so, such claims are almost always accompanied by a secondary claim under misfeasance. My expectation is therefore that we are going to see many claims against directors post COVID support ending and with the expected business failures that may involve. This is an area where insolvency is likely to involve issues of insurance. Sensible directors will have availed themselves of directors and officers cover. However, what happens if the insurer is concerned by a director's conduct? Well, we'll come back to that in a case study. Looking next at action against an insolvent insured. Section 132 of the Insolvency Act 1986 provides that where a winding up order or a provisional liquidator is appointed, no action or proceeding shall be proceeded with or commenced against the company or its property except by leave of the court. Similar prohibition exists as regards companies and administration but this can be waived by the administrator. This means if you need to litigate against an insolvent company, you must get permission first. I've helped clients in the past who, while being aware that permission was needed, didn't realize it required a court action in advance. We therefore faced a position where in order to beat a triennium for a personal injury claim on a Friday, we needed to present an urgent petition to the court of session on a Wednesday. Now, fortunately, in that situation, the liquidator confirmed that he had no opposition and we were able to secure permission very quickly, which allowed the service of a protective summons in the personal injury action. You can see, though, that if we had faced an uncooperative liquidator, while the petition could still have been presented, there is a risk that permission might have been refused. If that had occurred after the matter had time barred, the P action would have been unable to proceed with all of the attendant consequences that would involve. Again, as part of dealing with claims against insolvent insureds, we're often involved in restoring companies to sue for the benefit of insurance. There's two methods to achieve this administratively and via court, and we're naturally familiar with both. You should be aware that what a petition to sorry, I beg your pardon, that where a petition to court is required, this can take some time, depending on the circumstances and the attitude of the court. Again, if restoration of a company is going to be necessary, this should be done well in advance of any time bar to allow sufficient time. I would suggest regarding three months as the minimum time limit. Now, lastly, on this slide, we're going to look at the insolvency of clients. I mentioned that directors have a duty under section 172 of the Companies Act to act in a way they consider in good faith would be most likely to promote the success of the company. Now, the basic rule is, is that shareholder interests are of paramount importance when directors are taking decisions. This is qualified though, so that directors must consider the interests of creditors as well as or instead of shareholders where the company's solvency is in doubt. The practical effect of this is if you're assisting a business which has any concerns as regards its, insolven its solvency or insolvency, they should take advice before making any significant decisions. Could we have the next slide, please? Looking now at our case study. Here I acted on behalf of a director who faced a wrongful trading and misfeasance claim following the catastrophic insolvency of a business of which he was a non-executive director. He'd been engaged to advise on business development matters only. He attended four board meetings a year and was paid a thousand pounds for his services. Shortly after joining, he requested financial information, but only received partial details. He remained in post for about a year, but ultimately decided he was uncomfortable with the lack of detail coming out of the company. The company carried on for about another year, then failed. Following liquidation, it transpired that there were very significant sums due by the way of the managing director's, director's loan. 
Claims were made against my client and the other directors of the business, alleging that they had failed in their director's duties in failing to exercise due oversight of the MD and his borrowing, and as a result, were liable to repay the sums due by him. Following careful consideration of the case law, my conclusion was, despite the client's apparently limited role, he was at significant risk of being found liable to repay the sums borrowed by the MD. Now, given my past life as an insurance solicitor, I recommended we look at DNO cover. We were able to trace and engage with the relevant insurer who provided indemnity, and I thought that would be the end of the matter. However, the claim involved both allegations of misfeasance and wrongful trading. And when it came to settling the matter, the insurer questioned whether indemnity ought to be made available. They drew attention to the relevant elements of the policy, which could have, in my view, been have been used to refuse indemnity. Now, perhaps unusually, the insurer invited my comments on this on behalf of my client. I was able to argue that while he might be said to fall under the ambit of misfeasance, he had not, in my view, committed the offence of wrongful trading. And this was sufficient, in this case, for the insurer to provide indemnity and settle the claim on the basis that they accept that any poor conduct by the client had not been deliberate. I mention this case because I think the client was lucky. I had considered it could have gone the other way as there was sufficient ambiguity in the relevant clause to have refused indemnity. I expect that we will see many more of these types of claims as insolvencies then claims against directors will follow COVID. This together with the ongoing expansion of the use of litigation funding in claims in Scotland means we anticipate an increase in claims of this type. That's everything from me just now, and I'll be passing you on to my colleague, Laura Fell, to take the presentation forward. Thank you. Many thanks, Ian. So what is Directors and Officers Insurance or DNO Insurance, as I'll call it today? In a nutshell, DNO insurance is designed to protect directors and officers of a company from loss resulting from claims made against them in relation to the discharge of their duties as directors or officers. It's not compulsory, but it is good practice to have it and it's becoming increasingly common. So why is that? Well, because whether we like it or not, we do live in an increasingly litigious society and there is more scrutiny of directors. Therefore, there is a higher likelihood of allegations being made. As Ian has just covered, changes in the insolvency regime during COVID-19 could well give rise to a greater number of director claims following company insolvency. And other claims a director might face can range from the frivolous to potentially malicious claims brought by unhappy customers, all the way up to official investigations by regulatory bodies such as the Health and Safety Executive, SIPA or the FCA, depending on the sector or industry. Claims might also arise from decisions and actions taken by directors within the scope of their regular duties. Put simply, people, even at the highest level in the largest organisations, can make mistakes, no matter how prudently they act, and sometimes those can turn out to be really costly. Whether or not a director is ultimately found to be liable for claims made against them, the cost of investigating and defending those can be substantial, even if it is a spurious claim. So if there's no cover in place, either by way of company indemnity or from a DNO policy, the director will be personally liable to meet those costs. And that can be quite a sobering thought for anyone, given how expensive we all know litigation can be. I mentioned company indemnity there, and that's where the company has an obligation to indemnify the director for any financial loss to them while acting there in their capacity as a company director, i.e. the company has taken on a contractual obligation to cover such losses. That would likely be contained within the company's articles of association, but it's also good practice to have any such indemnity enshrined in an agreement between the company and the directors to prevent any dispute about the indemnity or the circumstances in which that's intended to apply. It's important to bear in mind, though, that there will be limitations to any company indemnity. In particular, it's only as valuable as the company's ability to pay. So if the company does become insolvent, the indemnity would fail and the director would require to meet the cost of his or her own, her own defence and any successful claim against them unless insurance cover is available. 
So that would obviously apply to the types of insolvency claim that Ian has covered today. Alternatively, the company might refuse to indemnify, and that can result in having to involve the company in litigation to try and enforce the indemnity and likely some strained relations with the company and the directors. So whilst the company indemnity can, indemnity can offer a level of comfort, many directors will also want to ensure there is DNO cover in place. The primary benefit of DNO cover is to provide financial protection for key individuals, whether directors or officers of a company or other organization against the consequences of actual or alleged wrongful acts when acting within their scope of their duties. The policy will set out in detail precisely what will be covered and each policy will turn on its own wordings and the circumstances of any claim. However, a DNO policy will normally cover defense costs, i.e legal costs of investigating and defending any claim, regulatory investigation or criminal proceedings, although usually only those costs incurred with insurers prior consent. There may also be cover for financial losses to the director. For example, in Ian's example, any sums the director had to contribute to repay the losses, the sums the MD had taken out of the company. However, some policies do specifically exclude certain fines and penalties against the company itself, so it's important to check the policy terms. Usually, the insured individual will also have an excess or self-insured amount to contribute to any claim at a level agreed at the time the policy was taken out. This kind of insurance also serves a useful wider purpose in that from a practical perspective, the security it provides can help directors to focus on making appropriate business judgments without becoming as concerned about their personal exposure or too risk averse as a consequence. Moving now to the next slide, just covering the typical features of DNO policy. So every policy will have its own wording and nuances depending on the insurers writing the cover However, in general terms, let's look at four key aspects. When cover applies, who is covered, what is covered, and the cost of cover. So firstly, when does cover apply? Cover tends to be provided on a claims made basis. So the policy covers all claims the insurer is notified of for the duration of the insurance period, i.e. the year the policy covers, regardless of when the event giving rise to the loss occurred. Claims made before the policy start date will not usually be covered unless that's specifically agreed by insurers. Who is covered? Usually the policy is taken out by and paid for by the company and it usually protects its past, present and future directors and officers. Those, though, as I have said, only for claims that are arising during the policy period. Certain employees and non-directors might also be covered to some extent for instance, if they are de facto or shadow directors. And others might also benefit under the policy. For example, the personal legal representatives of an insured individual might be covered for any relevant claims following that individual's death, insolvency or bankruptcy. Or a spouse or partner of an insured individual might be covered in relation to claims that they um, experience due to their relationship with the insured. Cover can also extend to claims relating to a subsidiary company for the benefit of its directors and officers. So it is really quite a broad group. Thirdly, what is covered? As I've discussed, the policy will meet financial losses and legal costs incurred in investigating and defending a claim. And my colleague Lynn will take a more detailed look at the types of claims that we typically see covered under DNO policies. However, various other losses can also be covered, sometimes through purchasing particular policy extensions, such as claims arising from pollution, the costs of crisis management and public relations after a claim, and cyber liability, for example, following disclosures of personal data and hacking events, for example. So you'll see that co coverage can really be pretty broad and the level of cover you'll need will just depend on what the company does, the kinds of risk the management team are regularly exposed to. Um, an insurance broker will do a thorough analysis of the risks and provide advice on a suitable degree of cover. So lastly, how much is cover? Well, the premiums charged will be based on the level of insurance which is required, but also taking into account information about the business, such as turnover, assets, and its overall financial position. Clearly, the number of individuals to be insured will have an impact, as will the geographical areas and jurisdictions the business, business operates in. 
if, for example, the company trades in the US, cover would likely cost markedly more given how litigious the US is and its punitive damages regime. The risk profile of the business will, of course, also be a key factor in determining the premium. So turning now to the next slide. So I've talked about what's covered and now we're turning to what is normally excluded from DNO cover, as it's really important to note that certain behaviours can have an impact upon the availability of insurance cover. Insurers will not usually make any payment for any claim, loss or investigation arising out of deliberate or dishonest acts of an insured person. Typically, these mean that the cover will, not, will be excluded in the event of a dishonest or fraudulent act or omission or intentional breach of statute or regulation, or where an insured makes a wrongful gain or a legal profit or advantage. However, there is some comfort here. This exclusion should only usually operate if and when a dishonest or fraudulent act has been confirmed by a court judgment or other final adjudication or an admission by the insured. Some policies will also allow declinature based on other evidence, for instance, um, a senior advocate or a barrister giving a written opinion that there's no reasonable prospect a court find, will find that such an act did not occur. This is the type of clause that insurers will have been concerned with in the example which Ian mentioned. There, Ian was able to demonstrate that there was no deliberate or dishonest act or omission by his client and therefore cover was preserved. So given the impact of COVID-19 on all businesses, we do anticipate insurers will be looking carefully at policy wordings. So it is more important than ever for insured persons to adhere to their obligations under their policies. That's something that businesses can be guided on by their insurance brokers. Some other common exclusions to mention include where an insured has failed to disclose a material fact, such as the existence of any claims, investigations, or losses, or anything likely to lead to those, which they knew or ought to have known about before the policy was taken out, or a claim which was notified under any previous policy. Prior and pending litigation. This is where policies contained a prior and pending date, which excludes any claim arising from a litigation that commenced or was pending prior to the date stipulated. And property damage and bodily injury, these are also usually excluded, although not always. So for instance, limited cover is quite commonly provided for indirect claims against directors and officers, alleging a financial loss to the company as a result of a bodily injury or property damage cover for defending gross negligence, manslaughter claims and breaches of health and safety legislation may also be provided. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Lynn Livesey to talk in more detail about potential claims against directors. Thanks very much, Laura. Yes, yeah, so um, let's turn now to have a look at the types of claims that the DNO cover may respond to. So you'll see there from that slide that it's quite a long list. It's not an exhaustive list, which in itself kind of highlights why this type of cover should be a serious consideration for anyone who might be on the receiving end of these types of claims. So I'm going to start by considering perhaps the most obvious type of claim, and that's employment practices and the HR claims. And that can include HR issues such as discrimination and sexual harassment. And there's a change of culture that we've seen in the workplace to speak out, and that change has the potential to increase allegations being made. It might not actually necessarily be the conduct of the directors or officers themselves, but could be a failure by them to enforce rules against discrimination and harassment in the workplace. In terms of employment related claims, Employees are more aware of their employment rights than ever before and are increasingly likely to claim. And the risks that have been created by the pandemic over the last 18 months are relevant here. Staff shortages, the risk of infection, employers' duties, whilst their workforce were at home, they're all some of the key issues that employers have faced during the pandemic. And really that is a session in itself and uh, we do have more detail uh, available on COVID and health and safety, which you can find on Brodie's YouTube channel. So next we have derivative claims. So that's claims that are brought by shareholders and investors holding directors responsible for losses. 
particularly in the US, we see that securities or derivative claims may be made by shareholders who are trying to relate a particular event to a share price fall or a regulatory investigation. And they use that to challenge prior company statements, which the company have made to shareholders and regulators in the accounts that they've stated there are no known issues. Examples could include a, a problem with a particular product, such a, as a medical device or a pharmaceutical, or a data breach that's caused a loss of personal information, which has resulted in the company falling foul of data protection regulations and being investigated by the ICO. And that comes with the risk of pretty hefty financial penalties uh, being imposed if there has been a breach. Claims can also be actions brought by liquidators where there's suspicion of wrongful trading or, or fraudulent trading. And as Ian uh, discussed already today, we do think there is going to be an increase in these types of claims in light of the changes to the insolvency regime during COVID. You can also have actions brought by the HMRC if they suspect misappropriation of tax payments and there are serious fraud office or police investigations as well. Certain company activities such as um, offerings of the securities or, or acquisitions, disposals, are, are also common areas where directors can face allegations of wrongful acts or misrepresentations with respect to the business. And directors can also face a wide range of claims relating to their day-to-day -day management of the company and, and a breach of their duties under the Companies Act that Ian touched upon earlier. Next on the list is reference to class actions. So depending on the jurisdiction in which the claim arises, you know, relevant security laws, shareholders may be able to bring claims directly against the directors, either individually or collectively as a, a class action, where the damages and the defence costs can be significant. And as many listening may be aware, since uh, July last year, we have the ability for class actions or group proceedings, as they are known, uh, to be brought in Scotland. So the likelihood is we're going to see more of this type of large scale litigation in Scotland going forward. And a key difference in relation to group proceedings is that they're opt in rather than if you could compare that to the US where proceedings are opt out. And that provision alone is likely to make a vast difference in terms of the number of claimants that we're going to see in such actions in Scotland. And, and the last type of claim to mention is official investigations from regulators such as SEPA, the Financial Conduct Authority, Health and Safety Executive. You know, regulators really are more proactive in investigating companies for failure to comply with matters such as trading standards, environmental breaches. And in particular, we frequently do handle claims relating to health and safety investigations by the HSC. And those can involve investigation not only of the company, but of senior officials within that company, such as your managing director, your health and safety director, um, for alleged breaches of health and safety legislation, which have either resulted in the death or injury of either an employee or a person that's been affected by the company's undertaking. So if there's a clear link between the breach and the actions of the director, then they can be prosecuted as an individual either instead of or in addition to the company themselves. So I've run through there some of the types of claims that could be made, but if we move on now to the next slide, if we can consider what is the most common types of claims? Well, from a legal perspective, where we see DNO cover coming in most commonly in terms of it being relied upon it is in relation to incidents in the workplace. And if you think about the impact of COVID on working practices in the last 18 months, we do anticipate that this is going to increase and be a real focus for regulators going forward. The civil claims, as many listening will be familiar with, do tend to fall under employer liability, public liability policies. However, if there's an associated regulatory investigation by your HSE and local authority, SEPA, the police, depending on the circumstances and how that investigation unravels, well, DNO really could come into play. So if there has been an alleged breach, the company will normally look to rely upon its employer's liability policy to try and cover the legal costs of defending any criminal prosecution. 
However, depending on the arguments that are put forward in defence, if a director is also being individually prosecuted, there's the potential for a, a conflict of interest if the director is placing blame onto the company to avoid prosecution or vice versa. And in such a scenario, the director could be left either having to fund the, uh, the situation themselves, and such things are, are not cheap. They can run to tens of thousands of pounds, depending on the course the case takes. Or that's where they may look to rely upon a DNO policy. And over recent years, we've seen a steady and significant increase in the number of individuals being prosecuted for health and safety offences, with that number tripling in, in just one year alone. And COVID-19 has introduced new risks and health and safety considerations for companies to consider. So the focus on individual prosecution is designed to push companies to take health and safety more seriously, and it is designed to act as a deterrent. And so it is a trend that is going to continue to push health and safety up the boardroom agenda. And that means that businesses will be wanting to ensure that they have suitable support and protection in place, should it be required. Um, and, and that is where DNO can be a very important tool. At present, you know, if an individual is prosecuted for a health and safety offence in the UK, under existing legislation, potential penalties can include financial penalties, community service orders, disqualification uh, of a director, but also custodial sentence. And the maximum penalty at the moment is two years. So the consequences of individual prosecution for health and safety can be significant. So having this cover in place to ensure your, your directors and officers are appropriately represented is worth consideration. So, so far we've, we've covered the protection that DNO policy can afford. However, once you've got that policy in, in place, it's important not to forget about it. So I'm just going to move on now to, to look at the next slide to touch on just a few practical considerations in terms of preserving cover before I pass back to you. So firstly, it's important to comply with the terms of the notification clause in the policy. Now, the precise terms of an individual policy should be reviewed to ensure that the correct notification is provided to the insurer. It's common that clauses require early notification of a claim or something which might give rise to a claim or regulatory investigation. And policies ordinarily also require insurers to be notified of any threat or commencement of disqualification proceedings against the director. Some notification clauses are condition precedents, which means that even if, if there is a failure to comply and a delay in notification, it's actually irrelevant whether that delays prejudice the claim and insurers might be entitled not to provide the cover. So really knowing the terms of your policy and when the insurers need to be notified is crucial. The next point to note is that admissions of wrongdoing in relation to what has happened or, or offers or deals or payments to resolve matters shouldn't be made. We often see people admitting or apologizing for an error, trying to fix things before they get in touch with their insurers. And whilst most likely that's been done with the very best of intentions, it can actually hamper the handling of a claim and it could have an effect on the cover. Because often policies will have clauses which actually require no such admissions or actions to be made or taken. So finally, it's important that the company cooperates fully with their insurers, including providing them with information or documentation that's been requested. Insurers may work with the company and allow them to handle the claim with the insurer's guidance, or they might decide it's actually appropriate for them to take the conduct and control of the claim on. And in that event, they'll likely take over the handling and probably appoint a solicitor or another agent to deal with it. While the company would still have input um, and be updated on the claim, again, you know, it's most likely that there's a clause in the policy which entitles the insurers to control the handling of it and requires that company to cooperate. So what I'd say is that the consistent theme across these points is knowing the terms of your policy, uh, knowing what you need to do or indeed not do to comply with it, and so that you can ensure that that cover is in place should you ever need to rely upon it. So I'm now going to pass back to Ian, thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn and Laura. Um, I hope everyone found that 
useful and interesting. You'll see that our full contact details are on screen. So if there's anything that you didn't want to ask in the open forum or discuss today, then please don't hesitate to give us a call or drop us an email and we'll be happy to have a chat with you. Thank you very much for coming along today.